Welcome. Uh, today is Friday the 13th of November 2020. Welcome um, to this week's edition of Music City Together Live, the weekly conversation program where we talk about what's happening in 2020. We talk about music ecosystems and we talk about how we're all trying to both navigate uh, the challenges of this most special of years and how we um, put this in the context of the work that we all have done for a long time and we're excited to do in the future. Uh, today's program is near and dear uh, to my heart. Uh, we're wrapping up our series of city showcases uh, with a, a program we originally were going to run a couple weeks ago. We had to reschedule due to uh, yet another hurricane in New Orleans, but we're going to be uh, visiting with a bunch of New Orleans music and cultural leaders and talking about all the complexities and wonders of the Crescent City. Uh, before we, we bring our guests in, uh, as always, just a couple of reflections on, on where we are and what's happening in the broader world uh, in terms of, of music and, and policy and the things that we care about. Uh, if you didn't have a chance to watch our program last week, we spent an hour talking about the election uh, and sort of the impact on, on music and, and kind of what to expect over the next yeah you know, six to eight weeks. Um, you know, if anything this week, uh, you know, the, the major update, which all of you know is is uh, complicating things even further is that the president has decided that he in fact won the election, which is making it very challenging both uh, for us to begin the transition in earnest. But I think more importantly, uh, for standpoint of people who pay attention to this program, uh, it really is holding up the potential of a meaningful sti uh, stimulus bill, which would be a vehicle again for the Save Our Stages legislation. So again, there's a great deal of uncertainty in terms of what the lame duck congressional session is gonna look like and how that's gonna take shape. And if there are prospects for a meaningful bill in the midterm, uh, if we have to wait uh, for the new Congress in early January, if we have to wait till the inauguration and the new administration coming in, um, it's a gut punch. You know, it's, it's really, it's extraordinarily um, uh, upsetting and uh, really frustrating for all involved when you combine uh, the sort of stuck nature of our political leadership with, again, the other side of the coin, which is the uh, remarkable scaling in COVID cases and what we all assume are going to be another round of shutdowns, I think everybody's ex exhausted and they're pissed and they should be. And, and so we're going to try to not dwell on that too much in today's program uh, and think about some, some bigger, broader things. But certainly... Um, frustrating times for people who are involved in music and music activism. Um, and hopefully we're going to get to this point sooner than later uh, where we're going to get that legislation passed and we'll get some relief for venues and, and for the broader community. Uh, the other piece of news uh, that we're excited about, uh, which we, we've talked about in the program, is that next Thursday and Friday uh, is our annual conference. And God knows everybody is excited to spend two days uh, looking at Zoom. Um, but at the uh, Music Policy Forum Intensive is taking place next Thursday and Friday. Uh, our producer, Alex, thanks as always, uh, is putting the link into the chat for registration. We've been working hard on the schedule. Uh, it's going to be published uh, either later today or over the weekend. Um, but the short version is that uh, we're really excited because we are really focusing, again, not nobody needs to go to a conference to talk about how powerful music is or the importance of meow meow, you know, really we're being very focused and, and action oriented in terms of uh, information that we think is going to be very important for the community. We're being talk about the 21 policy agenda. We're talking about um, some of the challenges that we have in music, music ecosystems and how we're trying to respond to those through strategy and through policy and, and philanthropy It's very grounded and very pragmatic and very practical. So we hope that uh, all of you are able to attend or interested to attend. Um, many of you are going to be speaking at it, which is going to be great to have you. And we're just really excited. And, and again, our team at Music Policy Forum has been putting a lot of work under the hood to uh, program this event and make it as, as uh, useful as possible. So um, this is kind of the end of the run for Music City Together Live. Uh, again, next week is the conference, then it's Thanksgiving, and then we're going to decide if we take the rest of the year off or kind of what we do with this Friday program. Uh, but there is no better way in the world to wrap up the series that we started back in March, at least this version of the series, with, uh, again, a deep dive on our friends uh, in New Orleans. So last couple of weeks, we've been starting with some music, and I think that's a great way to start. So Alex, if you don't mind, uh, we're going to start you off today with a, uh, a new track from one of our guests today, Cole Williams and the Cole Williams Band, uh, a, a song that is uh, particularly timely and particularly relevant. So we're, we're going we're gonna to kick it off uh, right with a little bit of music, Alex. Thank you. One, two, three, four. Hi, we're the Cole Williams Band. 
And we want to take this moment to tell you how important it is for all of you to wear your masks and stay socially distanced if you're a vocalist like myself or a horn player like Uncle P. It's also really important that you get out there and exercise your right to vote. A lot of people have died for our right to vote, and it's important that if we want to keep our democracy alive, that you get out there and do what it do. Peace. You want to do that song that we do? <laughs> We're going to do a, a new song um, that's on, from the upcoming album called Give Power to the People. This song is called Bear Love. I hate to cut that off. I think we could probably just enjoy watching Cole's work for, for an hour, but um, Alex is going to put the, uh, if he hasn't already, is going to put the link to that that track in, in the chat and along with uh, Cole's homepage and everybody needs to go check her out. Um, amazing work. Um, so let's bring in our guest, Ashley Keaton. Let's start with you, my friend, Ashley. Ashley, as many of you know, is the reason we have the Music Policy Forum. She's a co-founder of the organization and uh, a great inspiration to all of us. There you are, Ash. And um, mm -hmm. so actually let's start and talk a little bit about what, your day job. So talk a little bit about the Ella Project and the work that you do in New Orleans and sort of what insight does that give you into kind of the cultural ecosystems in that community? Sure, so, uh, and thank you for having us all here today. It's, it's really fun to see my friends, Cole and Howie, on the same screen with Michael. Yay. Really miss being around all of our people, right? It's been, yep. anyway. So I've been here since, I think Howie and I've been here the same amount of time. We've been here, you know, 25 plus 25 or so years. I founded the Ella Project, which is a 
nonprofit that provides uh, pro bono legal business and um, an advocacy platform for the New Orleans um, cultural community, which includes obviously, you know, musicians, songwriters, um, Mardi Gras Indians, Social and Pleasure Club members, which some of you watching may or may not know about, but that's a lot to get into right now. Visual artists, nonprofit groups, you know, um, theater groups, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I have been, so we, I formed that in 2004 and my, myself and my partner, Jean, have really expanded our programming from what started with just, not just, but, you know, legal transactions uh, with clients and really moved more into the advocacy realm, working as a kind of de facto liaison, not an appointed liaison, but a de facto liaison with the city or against the city or in conjunction with the city at times and a lot of other ways um, as well. So um, I have a very, through that and just through practicing as an attorney, um, I represented a whole lot of legacy artists that um, a lot of folks in the audience would know. I'm not going to name them right now, but I really got to know the community well, I believe, through my relationships with some of the more iconic um, performing and recording artists here. And a lot of them have passed, you know, um, but it still represent a lot. I mean, a, a, a great amount of people here and work deeply um, with a, a lot of folks in the community. And, um, and yeah, it's, it's been, it's been, it's been tough not being able to see my people because I don't, I'm not one of those lawyers that, you know, climbs an ivory staircase to my office to you know tell my secretary to, you know, fax someone a memo and, you know, send in the next person. Like, you know, I do my work in the streets and I mean, that's where I can be most effective. And, and, you know, we've, we've all been here a long time. I, I was here post Katrina and, and, um, yeah, it's, there's just a stark difference between then and now. We can talk about that later, but that's a little bit of my background. I'm also a professor at, at Tulane Law School and at UNO, but that's kind of less relevant. So one of the things I think is is certainly, you know, sort of baked into the culture in New Orleans um, is that people wear so many different hats. And, mm-hmm. you know, I think that, that goes without saying Cole Williams is involved in a lot why don't you talk a little bit about Cole and what when we bring why as we bring her in? Cole's like the supreme badass. I'm not gonna call her <laughs> Chris the other day, but that kind of pins her with against Ernie Cato. And I think the uh-huh. late Miss Antoinette is no. gonna be coming down and give me a little name is Antoinette. But yeah, well, I, I trust me, she was a dear friend of mine, and I, I'm not I'm not fucking with you. Um, so only if she deems it, I do not take that on, but that yeah, would be yeah. if she did, I'm like, I, I've got chills just talking to her. God, she used to make me wash dishes under such hot water, you know, well, but anyway, I, I, think I love that woman. Like, let me know why I fell in love with New Orleans because by way of Jamaica, West Indies and Brooklyn, we have like 25 jobs. So we do everything. <laughs> you want us on our, on your team, like during the apocalypse, because we're going to know how to do it all. Um, so I um, unfortunately haven't been in New Orleans for as long as Howie and Ashley, but um, my love for it is big. I've been here for six years now. And um, I don't even know, it was, I just said the spirit brought me here. I really couldn't tell you quite why I moved down here. Um, but this current state has really um, informed me and I feel super empowered and super exhilarated at like the work that's being done here on the ground um, and the conversations that the people are having. So anyway, I'll go back. So I'm, I'm Cole, I'm a recording artist, a record producer, um, musician, um, show host, a uh, community member with WWOZ. And I'm also a lead organizer with the Greater New Orleans Citizens Relief Team where we're reclaiming homes for the um, unhoused while teaching them marketable skills. And um, this is a really interesting time to be in New Orleans, I think, to be in the world. But um, every time I feel like I'm beat down or my people are beat down, um, something happens to give some hope. So this week, um, I'm very hopeful. I'm hopeful about the conversations, the meetings, um, like the, ac- the actions that I'm doing, the, the way I'm thinking about um, 
what's what's happening, what has to happen. Um, I'm more than happy to be a, a soldier and a servant for New Orleans culture. That's awesome. That's awesome. Cool. Appreciate that. And Alex, we'll put in the chat. You you joined us earlier this summer in a session with uh, our board member Hakeem Bellamy, and just had an amazing conversation that I strongly recommend if anybody wants to go back and, and take a look at that. That was was really one of the highlights of of this program by far. And then Ashley, I, I like the way you set up Cole. It's, what, what do you guys think about Howie Kaplan? Howie's the Howie's like all right. So Howie's the hub right now. I mean. It's- Howie hasn't been a hub before. First of all, Howie's club happens to sound just like Howie. I've never even asked you about that. Um, but but Howie's like, okay, so clubs aren't open here. But if you want to see musicians, if you want to feed musicians, if you want to take care of musicians, if you want to get your flu shot, if you want to get, if you want to get, you know, COVID test, you go see Howie. So he's become like, like, like the godfather sort of which is very strange, I think, for Howie. Um, but, but he's, he's kind of help, helping keep the rhythm moving from a physical uh, perspective. I, that's, that's, what I'm, that's what I think right now. And certainly, you know, a major voice on behalf of venues here, which is super important. Because Howie makes phone calls, and he answers phone calls, and he's hounding senators left and right, which is awesome. Got both of them. Uh, there you go. There you go. So I met with so Meatloaf. Happy. With Meatloaf. Let's start me off if I'm hungry. There you go. So Howie's Club, of course, is Holland Wolf, which is a legendary um, New Orleans club. And we're so happy you're, you're with us today. And and what Ashley's referring to is that he also is the Neva precinct captain for state of Louisiana, right? So statewide. Is that how you're organized? And, and so he has been part of the army that has been doing the incredibly impactful work to try to get uh, build congressional support for safer stages. And as he just referenced in passing, got co-sponsorship from both Louisiana senators, which is uh, a main reason, you know, the, the people have just working their tails off to get these senators on the record. We have 52 co-sponsors right now for Save Our Stages legislation. And that's why we're optimistic and hopeful that if and when there eventually is a stimulus and relief package that that bill is going to get funded. But so Howie, thank you uh, so much for, for joining today. And what I'd like to do with our time is, is, is three things, um, if we can. Um, I want to kind of set the stage. And again, these city tours we've been doing have been so fun, you know, because we've been in Portland and Seattle and Cleveland and uh, Denver and just all over, all over the country, just talking about music ecosystems, talking about community, trying to, you know, kind of paint a picture about what the scene is like, not just in 2020, right? So, I mean, we can talk about what this year has been. And, and I know there's, I mean, we, we can't ignore that. But what I'm also really interested for, for this hour or this program is, you know, kind of a picture of where this was like January 15th of this year. Like what, what was happening in the city? What, what were you thinking about in terms of policy and infrastructure and, you know, the challenges that the city always has had, you know, and, and, and likely always will have because New Orleans is the most complicated of all cities. And, and then I want to talk a little bit about what aspirationally we're hoping to see when we're over COVID. And again, we don't know when that's going to be. We don't know exactly what we're going to have to go through to get there. It's going to be awful. Um, so again, we, you guys can talk about it as much as you want to, but really what I'll, I really we're focused on, you know, in today's program is just sort of a vision for moving forward, you know, with this work, because again, you know, I, I say with all sincerity, Ashley's work around New Orleans cultural and, you know, infrastructure is, was the inspiration for music policy form. Like that's literally why we exist. And so I really want to talk about like, what is that work and, and how do we think about these like ecosystems and the New Orleans ecosystem? So why don't, you know, why don't we start there and, and I'll just kind of throw it out to, uh, you know, maybe, well, I want to just throw it out there for, for any of you, if you feel like you have something to say around this, just for starters. I mean, it's, it's January this year. We don't know that COVID is going to happen. You know, what, what's happening in the city? What's, what's, what's exciting about New Orleans? What are the challenges in New Orleans? Like how's the year kind of looking? I mean, what, let's just start from that standpoint. I don't know. Um, how you want to take that? Is that a direct enough question? Sure. No, that's that, that, that's easy stuff. Thank, thanks, y'all, for uh, for having me. I love seeing these two on, and, and you, Michael, as well. Um, January fifteenth, we're looking at probably one of the best music years that New Orleans has seen since since before Katrina. Yeah. Um, the Jazz Fest was looking fantastic. Bookings around town were doing great. Um, the convention business, the uh, private party business, we were a destination for nineteen million people every year, and the number kept creeping up, in, in no small part to the culture of New Orleans. Um, 
not just the music, but the culture bears. The culture bears are people that you interact with on a daily basis. The, uh, the sous chef at the restaurant you love, the uh, guy that parks your car, the guy in the, uh, in the Uber that drives you to your Airbnb when you come to town. It's one of the things that really speaks about New Orleans that, that we tend to forget sometimes. And so if you go back, um, I mean, our, my March, April, and May would have been the best three months I have ever had in the history of the Wolf. And October 1st was 20 years for me. Um, I think things were looking really good for the music industry. Uh, we were finally starting to make strides in actually having a music business infrastructure. Um, the conversations were getting more and more serious. Um, there were some dollars through, uh, uh, through, through some tax on the hotels that, that, were, that people were talking about and putting aside. Um, and then of course this hit. And so, so things change. Um, and so for the same reasons that we would be excelling at this point, and thriving at this point are the same reasons why we're, and the phrase I've been using is cultural extinction. Um, if there's any city that's that's at risk for this more than any other, it's New Orleans, because we count on tourism, we count on the musicians, we count on people like Ashley and Cole and you know the guys I've managed, the Grammy award-winning Rebirth Brass Band. One of the guys was working at Home Depot, another one's selling cars on the West Bank. So when you think about that two-time Grammy, Grammy nominee, one-time Grammy winner, over 30 years, you know, traveling the world. Um, you got to think about where the culture is going to come from at this point, because every bit of modern music can be traced back to New Orleans. You can trace it all back to Congo Square. It doesn't make a difference where you're coming from or how you're doing it. That's where it started. And so I, I'd love to keep a happy, positive face about it. But until people start coming back and until our musicians can start traveling again, because they don't make their money here. They make their money going to places like Austin and Nashville and Seattle, Portland. You can go all over and there's a huge New Orleans scene in all these great cities. And that's that's where the majority of our musicians make the bulk of their money. And uh, and I start worrying about that. Mm -hmm. So, Cole, let me kind of do the same question for you in terms of, you know, pre-pandemic kind of, you know, been in town for six years, things you know, moving in a positive direction, hopefully, you know, I mean, a lot of things going on. I mean, what's your, you know, kind of what would you want people to think about in terms of, you know, the New Orleans that you are experiencing, uh, both in terms of some of the challenges, but also some of the, the distinctive pieces that made it, you know, compelling and exciting for you? Wow. So I think Howie um, gave me like a great lead in. Um, speaking about just like the Sierra and I was having a great time this year. This was like my favorite Mardi Gras. You know, I feel like I really got it down this year. Um, there was just like a lot of opportunities, um, you know, stuff that I was working on personally, stuff with my band, and then like everything just came to a halt. And um, I just started noticing, noticing like, you know, the reasons that I came to the city is because of the culture, the culture bears of people. And I love how Howie mentions the sous chef and the Uber driver, these are all like parts of the fabric of New Orleans. That when you're having a New Orleans experience, you're experiencing all these dimensions. So we're all inside now. And so you're not getting, you know, the same flavor. Um, but I also started to think about what was happening to um, ensure that musicians had a livelihood to go back to. Um, more than just a grant program, which we absolutely needed, um, how is policies being changed? Um, how are we creating something new? And so from the ground, there's a, there's, there's a lack of optimism with musicians. Mm -hmm. They feel like they're ignored. They feel like they contribute so much to the cultural economy, yet um, at the bottom of the barrel when receiving information or receiving um, anything to move forward. Um, I do see a lot of musicians starting to come out and, and play. Um, I think that's great, but there's no structure. So like the musicians that are playing are um, also having to um, police their, their crowds and, and that's not fair to that musician. Um, there's a lot of work to be done, I, I think. And um, I'm, I'm not seeing, and, and this is not just in New Orleans, this country, we really need to get into some humanity where we can really um, in, in, in input some humanity into our policies, into the way that we're looking at these systems. Um, it, it, it's, it's so much bigger than where we are right now, but I, I also am fearful about what's going to happen to this cultural economy at the end of this. People that don't have the privileges, people that have to go to work a job that they did not train for, like Rebirth Brass Band, those are their careers. 
we are career musicians. So we need structure in order that we can continue to have a career as musicians, um, and particularly this city. So I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, as these conversations get closer together with all of the people involved, like we can really start some actions together um, as like one unit, you know, all the music investors at the table. Now, I, I appreciate that so much, Cole. And, you know, I mean, something that, you know, it, it, it just feels so stupid and corny, but one of the major threads that we've picked up on in all the cities that we've been working in is, you know, the, the stupid freaking Biden slogan of build back better is actually like completely perfect for this moment, right? Because the challenge for all of our music communities is not just to, you know, kit go again and get started. It's, it's how do we reimagine? How do we re, you know, think some of these fundamental things and, you know, actually bring you back in. I mean, I, I think one of the, so I want to be really clear, like New Orleans is super complicated and, and I'm probably going to like say a bunch of stuff wrong just because I'm not from there. I'm not in, you know, embedded there. So, you know, I want you to, to push back or clarify anything that you feel like is an unfair characterization, but it, it seems to me that New Orleans is so um, indicative of sort of the disconnect between being a culture and is how I was suggesting tourism driven economy, which has been meant that people like me, right, in Washington DC, like I get to go see Rebirth at 930 Club, you know, I get to see New Orleans musicians come through, I get to hear you know, Cole and her partners on WWZ. I get to travel down, you know, to Jazz Fest. I get to get the Airbnb. I get to do all the things, right? So New Orleans culture now, as it goes global, is like feeding us at such a high level, but it doesn't feel like there's a commiserate sort of level of commitment in terms of like infrastructure and planning and policy to understand like what is the impact and the human impact on the people who actually make this work, right? I mean, so like the disconnect between the economic driver for the city Pre, I mean, again, we're all talking pre-COVID, the economic sort of impact of the city, and then how does that translate into, or, 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 or be reflected in, again, support and dollars and, and resources for the actual people doing the work that we all love. I don't know, Ashley, I mean, this is something you've been struggling, not, well, struggling with is fair, yeah, actually, for a long, long time. Yeah, no, I mean, I have, and, you know, you ask about last January, besides, you know, sewing a couple of patches for Mardi Gras Indian youth and, and getting gearing up for Mardi Gras, I was writing proposals on how to spend this fair share, these fair share dollars that Howie was referencing earlier and how to, how to, you know, in, invest in the very community and the very ecosystem that, you know, again, not just feeds and nourishes our, 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 our residents and people who live here, but attracts these dollars, these coveted dollars that are actually not spent in New Orleans. For the most part, they're spent around the state, but to the extent that New Orleans does get a piece of the, of the uh, revenue that flows directly in connection you know, with the cultural community, it's, it, I mean, we've, we've celebrated 300 years of the same story that we continue to tell, which is that, you know, our cultural community is the fabric of our city. It is the most important component of our city. It's our identity. It is what we live and breathe. It's why we live here. And you know, like Howie and Cole said, it's not just musicians on stage. I mean, it's the sous chef. It's the it's the yeah. It's the the cab driver. I mean, it's all of us, right? I mean, I mean, I'm not calling myself a culture bearer, so let me be clear about that. But but I, but it, you know, it's 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 the way we are. It's the way it's the way that you've experienced New Orleans, Michael. I know I know you know that all too well. I mean. The problem is, is that, you know, the city doesn't reinvest in the very thing that's so easy to point to and to identify. It doesn't reinvest anything back into that that feeds the residents, that, that, that feeds our soul, and that attracts the dollars. So it's like, that's just fucking stupid. You know, it would be, so, it's just so easy. All right. Identify. Why do people live here? Why do want people want to come here? Invest in that. I mean, it is like simple fucking logic, but it's just never happened. The best thing that, you know, has happened as of recent, I'm going to say recent, you know, the last few years, this just for, you know, government to get out of the way and stop over-regulating, you know, culture, which was happening for so long. I mean, without getting into too much detail, we had, you know, we had, we had police wars, we've had police wars going back 300 years, but, but, you know, our last, you know, our heightened, um, uh, anxiety, you know, I think was, was really 
man manifested itself in 2005 when you know our, our indigenous culture bearers were literally you know uh, beat up on in the streets just for practicing a, a very peaceful tradition that's, that goes back to you know pre-slavery. So you know it's it's it, this is something that you know we have a there is a lot of room to build better, um, but it's 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 challenging. You know right before. Mardi Gras, I submitted to the city council and the mayor's office what I thought was a great idea to establish a nightlife advocate or a nightlife advocate program. And that came directly out of music policy forums, connections and network. Um, I was able to um, specifically work with the city of Seattle and Kate Becker, who is the creative industries point person and a fellow board member for music policy forum out of King County in Seattle. I took folks from city council, from the mayor's office, from our safety and permits department to study Seattle's models for how to handle, you know, the nightlife industries, which is, you know, which has a dual mission, right? To promote the nightlife economy and the cultural economy while balancing that promotion with reasonable regulation. So we looked at Seattle, we looked at San Francisco, we studied other models and we were making some headway and how we translate some of these dollars into investing into infrastructure, which is what the government can and should do. I don't expect them to come down and like, you know, save the world or like, you know, fix tubas or whatever, but they can, they can hire a fucking nightlife manager, right? Because they clearly can't do that with the existing, um, with the, with the existing framework that they have. And that's not a slide on Latoya Cantrell's administration. This has been going on for decades. For centuries. So at any rate, COVID happens and everything stops. And it's just been a, a really big challenge trying to reignite those discussions. That's happening to a certain degree, but it's it's a challenge from an advocacy standpoint because you I can't meet with people. I can't, I can't meet with people. You know, I have a very great privilege because I still have a job. You know, I still work as a lawyer. And that means I work full time. But trying to do that and manage the multitudes. Zoom meeting groups that often overlap in mission, but they won't meet together. And, you know, if I don't meet with one, then I'm, you know, what am I doing behind their backs? I'm meeting with someone else, you know, and it's, 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 it's become, it, I've never felt this challenge. I've never felt like I'm struggling so much to be an effective advocate. I feel very ineffective right now. And I know we'll climb out of it and talking with Cole and talking with Howie. I mean, you brought me to tears earlier. It's inspiring. It's what we need. That's how you get through it. But without that, how do you? And it's just been so hard. I mean, we got through Katrina. We got through Katrina because we could come together. You know, we could come together. We could, you know, music is healing. That's how we did it. 80% of our cultural community was back rebuilding this place for the rest of the population. And we can't, we are strictly prohibited. It's like, it's like our culture has been castrated, you know, and somewhat reasonably to a certain degree, but it's, I know, right? Um, but it's, you know, it, it's, that's how we, that's how we connect and that's how we, that's how we make things happen here. And to have that framework completely removed is, I, I, I just don't even know how to, I, I don't know how to navigate it. You know, Ashley, like, like a lot of those culture bears, a lot of people feel beat down and oppressed. Like they feel like, oh, here we go another meeting, we've been through these before, you know, they're, they're like having trauma, meeting trauma from past meetings that no, where nothing happened. So like their voice is very important. You know, we, you and I talk a lot and like before COVID. So I think that your voice as a trusted voice within the community is so helpful because well, you have the knowledge, voice. you know, you have the knowledge, you can talk people off of a ledge, you know, you can just give them more information you know, because a lot or of join, or join them. I'm like, I was going to say, have, did you hear me? <laughs> you talked me off the ledge. Don't push me off the ledge. I don't want to go now. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but if it is like a rainbow or something, maybe we can go off the ledge. <laughs> I want to know what's over there. <laughs> but you, got, you, you, you guys bring up a really good point, but the, but the big difference between between then and now, between Katrina and now, is we have the rest of the country behind us. Yeah. The reason yeah. there's a brass band scene in Portland right now is because a bunch of brass band musicians ended up in Portland. And, and it's not just a New Orleans export. It's a United, it's an American export. Our culture, our music, our films are, are exported across the world. It's our calling card. And when Congress 
and this is the NEVA part of me talking and the Save Our Stages part, when Congress neglects to address, you know, independent venues where all of this starts, Live Nation and AEG are behind us because they can't do what independent venues do. They can't do what New Orleans does. By the way, AEG has no presence in the market right now. Live Nation has no presence in the market right now. Like they have nothing. They, have, they don't have employees. They've got nothing here because they recognize that it's, if it's going to start, it's going to start from the ground up. New Orleans is very much a ground up kind of city. And I, we get ground up, but we very much are from the bottom up, I guess, is a, is a better way to put that. And as, as you're seeing trends, we're never at the forefront of the trends. Um, but it's amazing how we take control of things. You can look at bounce. You can look at, heck, even, even sludge metal. You know, this, this sto the stoner rock stuff. You can go back through all of that. I mean, where where does, you can go back 20, 30 years and where does all modern hip hop start? Right here in New Orleans. Where does bounce start? Right here in New Orleans. I think the only thing we can't take credit for is country. But even that, we're, we're making inroads in ways that you can't begin to comprehend. Um, our musicians are the best musicians in the world and that's not taking anything away from anybody else but you can take some of, the, some of the best musicians in the world and put them next to guys like Rebirth and Hot 8 and Big Sam, and they look like children. Because they, they, learn, they learn in a vacuum. We learn on the streets. Um, Derek Tabb, who started the Roots of Music, used to be the snare drummer of Rebirth, started this fantastic thing. He was nominated for a CNN Hero Award for starting an after-school music program for at-risk youth. Where else does that happen? And the reason he did it wasn't just because he felt like this would be a good thing to do a couple of days a week. He did it because he was worried about what these kids were seeing. He was worried after Katrina that at that point in time, where the music was coming from, because the music he grew up with came from the streets. He saw people playing horns and, and he worried about whether or not kids were going to pick up a horn or pick up a gun, whether they were going to join a band or join a gang, because the options aren't what they are in other cities. So when it's when we say it's a part of our culture, it's not just the culture that we export, it's the culture we live. And I think that's that's an important part of, of, of every conversation we need to have moving forward. Howie, I, I really appreciate how you frame that. And, and I think it, it connects in. And again, this is something we've been this is one of the reasons we want to do the, this this national tour with it, with our program you know, over the last couple of months, because there are some commonalities. So, I mean take as a presupposition that New Orleans is New Orleans is New Orleans and there's no other New Orleans and, and it never can be. And, um, and that's, you know, a good thing, right? I mean, that's a positive. There are those some commonalities that we're seeing in all these other cities across certainly United States, you know, we're seeing it globally as well, but certainly United States. And I mean, Cole, I mean, you, you, you're talking about your activism around housing policy. You know, we're talking about, you know, livability. We're talking about, you know, access to education and resources. We're talking about infrastructure. New Orleans has is, is got, you know, devastated infrastructure. Um, and then of course, you know, we have the existential threat of climate and, you know, what is gonna become the new normal. So there are these, you know, these challenges upon challenges that are, you know, I think one of the things that, you know, we are certainly we're thinking about, a lot of people are thinking about, but certainly we're thinking about and focusing on again, and, and, and I'll be really, really careful here, I'm not, you know, minimizing COVID. Um, but what we do want to say is that at a certain point, we are going to get past COVID. And we don't know if that's six months, if that's nine months, whenever that is, there will be a new thing happening, you know, globally. And, and there'll be a new thing happening with music. And it's going to be so interesting and important to be able to get back into those conversations around the kind of broader, you know, civic life and, you know, and, and, and the broader ecosystems where music kind of fits into that. I don't know. Um, I would love, I mean, Ashley, does that make any sense at all? Yeah. What'd you say? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Um, Welcome to my TED talk. No, 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 you don't sound like I tell you. Um, yeah, it does. It's just so hard. It's, we, we know we're going to get past this, but it, and, and we will do it together. But, at, you know, I, for me, speaking for me, you know, I'm at a point right now where, you know, there were some really positive things happening. I just, it's hard for me to feel that. And this is the first sure. time I felt that way, you know? And I don't know if it's because I'm just so overwhelmed because I'm not sleeping enough because too much computer, maybe my eyesight's, you know, I, I, I don't know, you know? I literally up from my Zoom chair nearly, you know, 
sprained my knee earlier. And I'm a dancer. Like, how does that happen? You know, sitting. <laughs> but, uh, it's so embarrassing. But, you know, I, it's what I think the challenge on top of not being able to meet, on top of not being able to really move the needle right now for reasons that are inherent to a, you know, our infrastructure or lack thereof. And, you know, just the spatial limitations, the physical limitations, et cetera. You know, we have our iconic venues and restaurants and places closing, people dying, you know, and it's just hard sometimes to like get motivated. You know, I mean, my best days, like I went and visited Howie, you know, when was that two, three weeks ago? That was one of the best days I can point to in the past six months. I can't wait for Cole to come back and come over because of the freaking hurricanes. Like how many times have we rescheduled? You know, and I mean, all we have to, I mean, I'm here, she's there. It's not like we're going anywhere, but I swear to God, if Hurricane Omega, if Hurricane the End comes this way, like how many times have we been in a cone of anxiety? I'm not, forget the uncertainty. It's a cone of anxiety. Nine, eight now, eight or nine. Eight. eight. Fuck that, you know? <laughs> I don't understand how hard it is to prep for storms. You know, I mean, we have it lucky compared to folks with all these fires everything else and we know that we know that we're not like it's not like oh poor us but it's but it's, it takes three days like to prep and i'm prep that's if, right. that's if we got power that's if we don't get is it, hit is it okay it's, if we join you on the ledge for a little while yeah. fuck <laughs> love, so, love you actually <laughs> 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 but i'm all right so, <laughs> Howie, I'd, I'd love your, your take on, you know, so, so part of the dynamic, so, you know, again, I think everybody watching the program knows that one of the initiatives that we um, have really put a lot of focus into this year is the REVS initiative and uh, Reopen Every Venue Safely, which again has 11 pilot cities across the United States, and we launched it in, in April. And the intention, of course, is not open early. The intention is open when the science allows you to, you know, as quickly and as safely as possible and make sure that, um, you know, we're, we're, we're taking care of our musicians and, and our music and venue workers and our audiences. And of course, we all collectively had to go through what I thought was fairly shocking, you know, after Memorial Day when we realized that, no, this was not going away. And then over the last six weeks, we had to go through, again, what I feel like is pretty shocking is seeing the President of the United States run around the country doing super spreader events, the exact type of things that we aren't doing, right? That the music community is not doing. And I, I, I don't know how I kind of what the dynamic is in, in um, New Orleans proper. I, I, I know, you know, sort of, I've, I've heard rumblings of like Baton Rouge and Tiger Town and just the bar scene getting out of control and that contributing to, uh, you know, kind of to where we are and, and where we're headed. But what has that been like in New Orleans in terms of, you know, venues trying to do one thing bars, maybe doing something. I mean, I'm not, what's that just been like from your standpoint? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, and, and, and the great thing about, about what's going on with Neva um, is that we get a chance to talk to people all across the country. We do our weekly calls um, twice a week. And so I've been, I had the great opportunity yesterday to sit down and talk to a bunch of folks that, that we've known for years and years and years. And to kind of get to your question, I wish I could answer it. Yeah. Because as of right now, the city and the state government can't answer it. So I'll give you a great example. The state fire marshal um, and his office of epidemiology um, have determined he doesn't have an office. Of, I was being sarcastic. Um, but they have determined that um, that music venues need to have very specific specific HVAC requirements. Um, you know, we have to have air return six times. It's got to have, you know, all these different things have to happen. This is through the state fire marshal, not through the Department of Health, but through the state fire marshal. And so I was on one of the early Zoom calls when they announced this. And I'm like, so this is in the interest of public safety. Right. And at the time, they weren't allowing anybody to do music anyway. So it didn't matter. And we get it. We understand we're the first to close, last to open. You're a music venue. Our whole business model is based on people getting in like this and feeling the music and feeling the energy of everyone. And um, that doesn't happen on a, you know, on a live stream. And I said, this is in the interest of public safety. And they're like, well, absolutely. And I said, okay, so is there any reason that only music venues have to do this? If it's really in the interest of public safety, why don't restaurants have to do this? Retail, bars, houses of worship, where you're allowing 250 people to come in and by the way, sing without masks. The same thing that we're not allowed to do. 
not not harping on anybody. It just made no sense, and it still makes no sense. Now we come back to 3.3 in the city of New Orleans. We have no idea how to navigate this. All we know is that you're allowed to have percussion and you're allowed to have string instruments. There can't be any singing, and that's it. No brass bands, no woodwind, nothing. So when you're sitting there trying to navigate it, how do you how do you figure out what the next step is? How do you figure out how to rebuild a culture, how to rebuild something that people can come back to? By the way, think about all the music venues and all the musicians. If there's anybody that knows how to do an event safely, it's the people that do this responsibly every day of the week. By the way, we have ticketing systems. You want contact tracing? Everybody buys a ticket. You can lie to anybody else. You can't lie on your credit card. When you make a reservation somewhere, there's things you can and can't do. So they're not listening. And it's not that they're not listening because they don't care. It's because they don't understand. And it goes back to what Ashley was talking about and what the Res Initiative is about. It's about getting them to understand that this is one of the big art cultural exports put so many dollars into the nightlife, into the hotel, into everywhere. You know, that one of the Neva studies out of Chicago was for every dollar you spend in an independent venue, $12 in indirect spending goes out into the community. Some places upwards of 15, which is New Orleans, that's probably probably there. Someone buys a $30 ticket here, they're spending $450 related to that. That's crazy. And that's including landing fees and hotel fees and Airbnbs and restaurants. You can go down the pike. And the sooner that we get them to understand that, I don't think it's because they don't want to. I think it's because as an industry, we haven't done a very good job of selling what we need to sell. And so hope that answers your question because I have a tendency to go off on a few different different points there, but and that's I, where we are. I want to echo what he said. And I don't want Cole to talk because I don't want to take up any more time, but, but I forgot what I was going to say. No, I'm just kidding. I, another factor that goes into that is the fact that, you know, our cultural community really loves doing what it does. So there's a lot that we give away when I say we, that, that, I mean, and it is because that's just part of everyday life. Right. Um, and so there's, there's been a lot of taking for granted, you know, over a long stretch of time. Um, I'll also say that while there have been, you know, administrations that have shown a lot of, or seeded a lot of adversity, you know, in the cultural community while, while we're having problems right now, while there's, you know, infrastructure issues and lack of coordination, this is something that's not new. And it is something that I do think, I, I do think that our, the current mayoral administration and members of city council do want to help. And they were demonstrating that, you know, prior to COVID, but this is just, I mean, you know, when you have problems, before COVID, challenges before COVID that relate to coordination and relate to lack of infrastructure, those problems are just compounded. You know, they're, 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 I mean, everything is escalated. Everything that was a challenge before is worse now. So I hope- interrupt, I'd interrupt for one second, just so people have an understanding. The New, yeah. New Orleans economy is based on the port. It's based on oil and gas and it's based on tourism. Mm -hmm. We don't have biotech. We don't have IT. We don't have financial services. We have none of those pillars. And right now, if Tulane University wasn't in session, we'd be so beyond screwed. It's not even funny because they're the largest employer in the city. Mm -hmm. If they weren't in session and those kids weren't here and those people were not working, it, it's mind boggling. We're a block away from the convention center. $1.4 billion lost through the end of this year through next year. Nobody can absorb that. And so my concern for the culture is very much about those people coming back. Yes, we need to reimagine. And I think that's the conversations, you know, that we've all been having. And the Revs Initiative has been, what Kate's done has been phenomenal. And, uh, and some of the conversations that we've been on have been amazing because it makes us reimagine. And so that's kind of where the focus is now. We can't be, I can't be a music club right now. Like I'm opening up a coffee shop in the Howland Wolf because I've got to pay bills. I don't have a choice. So we're figuring out ways, little ways to, to start doing things that need to happen. But we need to bring government in, city, state, federal. They all need to be a part of the solution. And understand something, as, as New Orleans goes, New Orleans falls culturally. We are a sadder country. I mean, and you can ask anybody in the music industry anywhere. There's a reason why 
people revere New Orleans and revere our musicians and revere our culture. And the musicians, hey man, I'm, I'm fighting this, not, I, this isn't totally self, I'm not doing this as a selfless act. I'm doing it because without these musicians and without this culture, I've got a huge stage with 10,000 square feet that, that goes nowhere. And so every, every step we're taking to get government to understand that, the city and the state, and I think we're doing a really good job. I think we're getting to that point. And it's not something that's going to happen overnight. And instead of yelling and screaming, like we were talking about earlier, you were talking about the election, the stuff y'all were talking about, it, there's been enough yelling. It's time for everybody to get together. I could care less who you voted for. And that's been a really, really positive thing that's been happening here in the city is that as people are coming in, we're recognizing we can work together to solve these issues. Um, it's it's going to be a tough time. We accept that. But I think the, the more we're able to work together and recognize, heck, one of the things New Orleans has never had for their musicians, and you guys can, can call me out on this, mailbox money. How is it that Austin and Nashville do it fantastically? New York, Chicago, L.A. How are we not teaching our musicians how to get the money from the PROs? How are we not using the system to, right. as other well, that's something that Cole can speak to because, and how I don't mean to interrupt you, but Cole, oh. you know, Cole's been overseeing, like leading the Revs Musicians Working Group. And I mean, they've been talking about all kinds of things. I'll, I'll let you talk about that, Cole. But I mean, that, that goes hand in hand with what Howie was talking about just now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so with the Revs calls, uh, our group are the culture bearers and the musicians specifically. So we've been meeting since, is it March or April? April, we started meeting. Um, well, at least since April to now, we meet once a week. And um, I've noticed the conversation shifting from, it was kind of like, what can we do right now? Like, how are people gonna survive? Like, let's talk about that long-term stuff to actually we have to start reimagining. You know, so we're in the space where we're trying to reimagine what do concerts look like um, when we go back out in, in the streets. And a big thing are right now, um, these permits and these, um, special event permits and certifications, um, it feels like this burden is now being passed on to the musicians that musicians didn't have to carry before without any other compensation. And I'll say this even with the venues too, um, all these permits that have to happen, but there's no uh, money being put in to like support people to get these things. And you know, it's gonna change next week and it's gonna change like the week after that. So there feels like a general lack of support, but what really feels good is that everybody is geared towards taking action um, and taking action towards having our changes be policy so that it's not just, we don't like this and can you change this? But then when that person is out of office, it just goes away. But the things that we really wanna see happen as musicians and culture bearers, we're very interested in having those things passed um, as resolutions. So uh, understand with, with the permitting process, they actually, I'm, I'm a part of a group with the city and they're, they're actually make, they're asking for changes of how to make this easier. Yeah. Like what they can do to make it easier. I don't, I don't think they made it. I don't think they purposely made it. I think they just don't get it. Whenever someone, you got to, we got to give everybody the, instead of the screaming and yelling that we sometimes do, I think it's, it, it's important, not just in New Orleans, but all across the country. When they don't get it, let's, you know, use, use a New Orleans phrase, let's learn them. Uh -huh. Let's teach, educate. Them, teach them, teach them how to understand how they can do this, how they can make music be a part, how to make it easier for the musicians. I 100% agree. The thing with the permit was, and, and partially that was one of my comments was because they kept shutting things down when one person did something bad. And I said, why not just give everybody a permit and then pull the permit when they misbehave? So that's part of the reason I'll take somewhat responsibility for that one. Yeah. Um, but they're right. Like there are bad actors already. You can look on, you can look at Bourbon Street. You can look at Frenchman Street. Heck in my own neighborhood, I've got a bad actor. I've got two bad actors in my neighborhood and they've both been cited, not because we turn them in, but because they're bad actors. They're doing things that they shouldn't be doing. Well, and how so, we go back to the policy part, like, like, um, and, and, and just the, the, the knowledge that like, um, people that make decisions have about culture and music, you know, that's also one thing that the music community has been talking about. Where are the voices of the musicians and the culture bearers at those tables? You know, um, wouldn't it be easier? So I'm just thinking like, I'm not really good with math, 
but it would make sense that like if there's a table of decisions being made for certain groups of people, that if you don't have a good understanding about that group, that you get an expert in. And those experts would be like your uh, musicians. And I'll give you a great example. So, so I was on one of the governor's task force, the reopening task force, and they had a fair festival and venue committee. And they, I think they met for six weeks and I was asked to sit in on the sixth week. And the first thing that the very first thing that I asked was, and I'm looking through and I'm like, I don't recognize any of the names. Is, and I'm like, is anybody else here representing a fair festival or a venue besides me? And there was not one. Oh no. And I don't think they thought about it from that. You had somebody from the LRA. Okay, that's, that's awesome. You had somebody from you know this board or that board. That's great. But none of them actually represented a fair festival or venue. Um, right. I'm in a unique position because I'm not just a venue owner. I'm not just a talent buyer. I'm not just a manager. I'm all these different things that come in. And it's my goal is to, and it, and again, it's a selfish, it's a selfish goal. I want to bring everybody up. I don't want brass band musicians getting 50 bucks a man to do a second line. Cause that's dumb. You know, when they do that, they devalue it for everybody else. And so the goal is to raise the floor. And that's one of the things that Ashley and I have been talking about. It's one of the things that's part of the REVS initiative. It's one of the things that everybody is thinking about. The problem is, is when, and I've been in a lot of these meetings, some, it depends on who you bring in. Because someone that gets that there's a bigger picture and not just their picture needs to be a part of the solution. When it's just about them, they shouldn't be a part of the solution. Because it now becomes about them. So this collective- we, we, need, we need people that think about that. And there are people as part of these discussions that, that we've been having that are representing everybody. The problem is when you get everybody in, it, it, it sometimes turns into this fight that it loses focus on what it is. And so I fully agree. And, and after this, I'd love to have this conversation after we've done this. And I apologize. We kind of, Michael, we kind of just took that over. Um, you're passionate. You're passionate. But- <laughs> no, no, it, no, we're all passionate, but, but I think there needs, to be, a bigger, there needs to be a bigger picture conversation and a smaller picture conversation. So. Well, you're like, you're saying all, like you're saying what I'm feeling, what I'm experiencing in like your way, because it's actually, it's not selfish to want to raise the bar because like we have to be inclusive. It's our mu- musicians yes. that are like busking. They're just as important because when people are going to Howl and Wolf and they're hanging out, those street musicians are there, like keeping them busy. And then they're going to go to another club. So it's it, it's a complete community. It's really holistic. So I think very, everybody should be brought up. Very, very much so. And I'd love to have this conversation because there, there are things that are going on. There are okay. there are voices. There are voices being heard that aren't just about the big interest or anything else. So and right. and and, this, and all these conversations need to take place. And, and Ashley and I have had this conversation well, probably but, how many times over the last seven months or a ton. And so have Cole and I. So I'm having this conversation. This is to my earlier point with a ton of people. Y'all do me. And then I'll come. I, y'all have three cocktails of the world. I'll join on the fourth one. You know? <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to come by and see how. We need, we, need, we need everyone to like come together, you know, and, and, and not be so siloed. Oh, there's just so much, you know, because we're all, and, and that's one of the things I love about the three of us getting together is that, you know, it's a great illustration. Like we're all on the same page, but I can't believe you two haven't sat and talked about this shit yet. You know? Well, we, 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 we all will. We all will. And as, as, as all, the voices we begin all have heard. Opinions, but we all are intentional about having agreements. Like we know yeah. how important agreements are. So we always come to the table like that. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think to build off what, what some of that, how was saying, I mean, I, I think the hope for all of us is, you know, as we move into, you know, the next era of what our, what, what our lives are going to be like is, is hopefully the temperature is coming down, you know, hopefully that we're, we're not going to feel like everybody's has to be pitted against each other, that, you know, everything's a zero sum game that, you know, whether it's at the local level, trying to kind of, you know, be intentional with what are the things we have control over in our, in our community that we can actually take action on, whether it's, it's, it's taking those local conversations and linking them together to other cities and other communities to, you know, sort of say, what are y'all doing on this and how are you doing on this? To see, again, I mean, the, 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 I feel like I say this every week, but I mean, you know, what's happened with Neva this year has just been one of the great joys of my professional life to see, you know, scale of the independent you know, venue community coming together to really have the potential to do some things that, 
you know, we've needed to be able to do for a long time. And then hopefully, and we'll see what happens, but, you know, hopefully we're going to be in an environment with the federal government that is maybe a little bit um, more functioning, a little bit more tuned into the needs of culture and a little bit more eager to understand what they can do that's impactful. And again, you know, we, we, we forget that, um, you know, in, in, in the previous administration, there was a significant effort at the Department of Housing and Urban Development to understand how their annual investment of 60 billion a year in cities intersects with culture. They put out $100 million in planning grants in 2010 to ask counties to help them figure out what is the intersection between applied policy and investment and how that, that plays out locally. I mean, there's just a lot of, of, of potential when we get to that next stage. So again, that's not to say um, that the next six months are going to be anything but an unimaginable hellscape, but it also helps us you know, to keep going to know that there's something down the road coming and that collectively we have the, you know, we have the potential to engage in ways that maybe we haven't before, you know, either locally or, or as, a, as a broader community, or at least we, we haven't had a chance to. Yeah, Howie. Michael, I, I, I can't, so I apologize. Um, I just found out I have a fractured femur. And so Ooh. I'm actually, I need to head out in a moment. Well, so we I'm are done. Gonna, we, we are over um, time. But, so. but I did, I did want to say one thing based on what you just said. And, and it, we've already started and, and we've been talking with folks within Neva. We're already thinking about the power that we've done. I mean, what, what Dana and, and the folks that, you know, just the amount of present and the amount of presence that we've gotten out of, out of these conversations for Save Our Stages, we're already looking at the next step. Yeah, the exactly. next step is the next step is to now say we are we are powerful. Like yeah. we, we are parts of our communities, not just the venues, but understand the venues don't exist without the musicians and the musicians can't exist without the venues. And exactly. you guys made fun of the meatloaf call. But so for those of you really quick, we had a we had a we had a legislative call with meatloaf and Senator Kennedy. OK, oh, most, that's funny. They oh, really my God. Know. One of the most yeah. one of the most messed up calls I've ever been on in my life, but man, it was it was beautiful. And I think number I think Senator Fifty One was Senator Kennedy from Louisiana, there and so understand this isn't this this battle doesn't end when Save Our Stages passes, and it will pass. Yeah, no matter That's what right. happens, it'll be a part of it. Even McConnell has mentioned it. That's Even right. Rubio has mentioned it, and it comes through Rubio's committee. And and we've, got, we've got Rubio and Kennedy. We've got the people we need. We're working it. We're doing yep. what we have to do. But understand, this battle doesn't end That's with right. Save Our Stages. So it keeps, so going I, it keeps going with Cole and everybody else. Yeah. Yep. That's exactly what I was, so was going to say. I just texted both of you each other's contact. So action, action, action. All right. Howie, go take care of your broken leg. Thanks. Cole Bye. and Bye. Ashley, thank you. As always, uh, we can't wait to see both of you next week at Music Policy Forum Intensive. Thanks, as always, to our producer, Alex Dolvin, who does such a great job making this look easy. Um, thank you, of course, to all of you who watch this program and participate. We really value, value your feedback and your ideas and your very ginger constructive criticism. Uh, you can always hit us up at musicpolicyforum at gmail.com. Again, next week is the intensive, and then we're going to take time uh, time off for Thanksgiving and, and all the rest of it. And, and uh you know, frankly, the future of the show is really uh, dependent on the audience and if you guys want uh, to keep participating in this thing. So we'll, we'll uh, revisit that down the road. Thanks again to everybody. Um, have a great rest of your Friday. Um, you, and we will. Thank you very much, guys. Next Thursday. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.